The night had fallen. All the dogs had gone silent. The lights in the windows of the houses had been extinguished. The silence hung in the air like a taut string. The world gradually drifted into slumber, waiting to reveal all its colors again with the first rays of dawn. Anna, a young woman of about 30, sat on the porch of her house, gazing at the night sky. There, stars shone like they only do in August. It seemed as if someone had sprinkled grains across the sky, dipped in phosphorescence. It was chilly. Anna shivered and wrapped herself tighter in a light shawl. Yes, had it all gone away, the frost would come soon. It was sad, and it hurt, but the pain in Anna's heart wasn't from the changing seasons. It was from the fact that she was now all alone. It had been forty days since she had buried her beloved husband. Anna stared at the stars and remembered how she and Michael used to sit on the porch like this at night, with the same sky above them. Sometimes they even saw a shooting star. Michael always managed to make a wish, but she never did. Then her husband would laugh and say, Your wishes are too long. You should wish for something simpler, but what could be simpler? Anna simply wanted to have a child, but it wasn't meant to be. They had spent almost ten years together, always dreaming of becoming parents, but doctors had given them various diagnoses, prescribed additional tests, and it had all been in vain. Anna and Michael even traveled to the capital city to see the best doctors, but they couldn't help. Anna remembered how she waited for the results of her tests, how nervous she was. The result was always the same in fertility. Sometimes it felt like she was losing her mind. Sometimes she would walk down the street and peer into baby strollers. She loved looking at those little angels. She imagined herself walking with a stroller like that one day, but fate was relentless. Anna was barren. Michael had once mentioned the idea of adopting a child from an orphanage, but Anna resisted. She honestly confessed to her husband that she wouldn't be able to love someone else's child. She liked admiring children, but taking care of a child she hadn't given birth to, hadn't carried, was a boundary she couldn't cross, a level of squeamishness that a biological mother never had to think about. Michael understood his wife and didn't insist any further. So, they lived in the countryside, and it's worth noting that they lived well. Michael was a farmer, and Anna worked at the library. They moved to the village right after getting married. In reality, they were both from the city, but they ended up in the countryside by chance. When they got married, Michael's business in the city suffered a severe setback. He had a small auto parts store that used to bring in a decent income. But then the crisis hit, and then another one. Michael realized that he was starting to operate at a loss. Meanwhile, Anna's grandmother in the village passed away, leaving her a small cottage. Anna's paternal grandmother had lived her whole life in that village. She was a sweet, kind old lady. Anna was deeply affected by her death, and her husband provided comfort. His support was crucial. At the funeral, Michael surveyed the rural landscape, talked to the local residents during the memorial, and realized that there was a vacant niche to take up farming. So, Michael sold his business in the city. He took out a loan and started building a life in the countryside. Anna supported her husband's decision. In her childhood, she enjoyed spending time at her grandmother's in the village, and secretly, she had always dreamed of a quiet, peaceful life away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Certainly, Michael and Anna's parents didn't understand their decision, but they never asked, and with time, it became clear that Michael had made the right choice. Over the years, he managed to restore what had been neglected for so long. Ripe fields now waved in the wind, cows lowed in the barn, and modern machinery adorned the farmyard. During the harvest season, a dryer hummed day and night, so loud that the entire village could hear it. But no one complained. On the contrary, people were happy because now there was work in the village, all thanks to Michael. Michael had boundless energy. Here on earth, he suddenly realized that you didn't have to do business only in the city. Things could go well in the countryside too. Next to Anna's grandmother's cottage, he built a house and together with his wife, they planted a garden. After the form, Michael planned to start another venture and orchard. Not just one with apples and cherries, but also apricots, pears, and grapes. For this, Michael started studying horticulture. He could spend hours reading specialized literature. He even had a secluded corner in an old barn converted into a study. 
There was light, a chair and a table, and even a stove for the colder days. Anna couldn't understand why he didn't just set up his study in the house, it would be much more comfortable there. But Michael laughed and said that he felt closer to nature in his makeshift study. He laughed, but he also made sure Anna didn't enter that particular barn. When Michael wasn't around, it was always locked. His wife didn't take offense. She understood that it was best not to distract her husband from his new passion. After his regular job, Michael would read books for gardeners. He even consulted with nurseries a few times. He was well on his way to realizing his next dream. He had already prepared the plot for the future orchard. Everything would have worked out for him if it weren't for one tragic evening when Michael's back started hurting severely. During the day, he had helped some men unload bags of cement. He thought he had simply overexerted himself, straining his back while carrying the heavy bags. Anna scolded him at the time. Why do you take on all this work? There are hired workers who get paid for it. Michael just waved it off, saying, if I didn't help, it would have taken longer. Besides, it started drizzling, and the cement could have gotten wet. Anna just sighed, then applied some pain relief cream to his back and headed to the bedroom. Michael said he would work a bit longer. He wanted to acquire a new combine for the form, and there was a chance to qualify for a program that offered incentives. But it required collecting a bunch of documents. So, Michael was double-checking if all his paperwork was in order. You really don't take care of yourself. Anna shook her head. Your work isn't going anywhere overnight. I'll just sit for half an hour. Michael weakly smiled and winced. Your back is hurting. Let's go to bed. Just a little while longer. He promised his wife, and she left him to it. Later, she reproached herself for not waiting for Michael. Maybe she could have helped. On that evening, she had barely touched the pillow before falling fast asleep. When she opened her eyes the next morning, an inexplicable sense of unease gripped her heart. Michael wasn't by her side. Had he been working all night, perhaps he'd fallen asleep on the living room couch. She got out of bed and headed to the living room. Michael was lying on the floor, face down. In that initial moment, Anna thought he was just sleeping, but then a shock surged through her. He looked unnatural. Something was wrong. She rushed to her husband and then froze. He was already cold. Anna began to scream. Her neighbors heard and rushed to help. Later, at the morgue, she was told that Michael's heart had been as fragile as a piece of cloth, worn out like that of an 80-year-old man. Why? How? Michael had never complained about his heart, never drank, never smoked, and never got upset over trivial matters. To this, the pathologist wisely remarked, not complaining doesn't mean it didn't bother him. Yes, that was Michael. He disliked paying attention to his ailments. If something hurt, he'd take a pull and continue his work. He was always consumed by his work, and that's how he ended up burning out prematurely. A heart attack, an infarction, and death. Anna couldn't fathom that it could happen like this. People from the city, all the villagers, and fellow farmers came to bury Michael. Everyone respected him and genuinely mourned his death, but it was especially hard on Michael's parents. Anna couldn't believe that he was gone. After the funeral, Michael's parents insisted that she return to the city, but she refused. She couldn't abandon Michael's legacy, of course. She didn't understand much about it, but she would figure it out. And for this, Michael's parents were grateful to her. The form meant more to Michael than just a business. It was his passion, and it would be a shame to let it all go to waste. Perhaps Anna could keep it going and even enhance his good name for generations to remember. And so, 40 days had passed. In the meantime, a manager named Joseph had been taking care of all the farm and field responsibilities. He had a wealth of experience in farming, having grown up in the area. Anna could rely on him. However, the woman was only now beginning to realize the immense burden she had taken upon herself. Anna stared at the night sky, her thoughts darker than ever, and then, high up in the heavens, a bright star fell. Interestingly, this time it seemed to fall for an exceptionally long time, or so it appeared to Anna. At least she had time to whisper her heartfelt words. What were they? She herself didn't realize immediately, and then she scolded herself. Why now, when Michael was no longer there? Now she was alone, and that's how she would be for the rest of her life. She vowed to never think about this painful topic again, but her heart couldn't be stilled. That night, 
Anna whispered. I want a child, the star extinguished. Anna shivered from the cold. Such sharp temperature fluctuations in August, during the day, it was scorching, and at night, it was chilly. Oh well, as long as there were no frosts, it was still early. Anna sighed again, got up, and headed back to the house. She needed to sleep. Tomorrow, she had to hand over the library to the new employee, and then she'd have to go out to the field. Joseph was doing well, but Anna needed to immerse herself in the work too, and maybe that's for the best. There's hardly any time left for sorrow, and the heavy thoughts recede. But as Anna fell asleep, she still cried, remembering her husband, how she loved him, and she still loves him. All night, Anna dreamt as if she were cradling a baby. She could even sense the sweet scent from the baby's head. The baby looked at Anna and smiled, and she smiled back. She woke up with a smile on her lips. She remembered the dream and was surprised. Who was that, a boy or a girl? She couldn't tell. But the feeling of maternal happiness lingered as if she had truly held her own child, her own flesh and blood. Yes, Anna didn't know who it was, but she did remember the child's eyes, remarkably reminiscent of her husband's. Memories of Michael immediately wiped the smile from her lips. Yes, it was a good dream, but now it was definitely an unattainable one. Anna let out a heavy sigh, got out of bed, and went to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. In the kitchen, she grabbed the first cup she saw. Her hand froze. It was Michael's favorite cup. And this little spoon here, he always used it to stir sugar. While the kettle was boiling, Anna sat in what used to be her husband's seat by the window, brought the spoon to her lips, and started to think. Maybe her parents were right, insisting that she return to the city. Everything here reminds her of Michael, and that's what hurts so much. It's painful to realize that she will never see him again, never hear his voice. The kettle had long since switched off, but Anna still sat there, staring into space. I'm not going anywhere, she finally said aloud, as if someone else might hear her, and reached for the kettle. After drinking her coffee, she quickly got ready and rushed to the library. There, waiting for her by the closed door, was Nina, the woman she was going to hand over her duties to. To be honest, Anna felt a bit apprehensive about this elderly lady. Nina had spent her entire life working at the village school, serving as the principal for many years. She was authoritative, a woman of few words, but when she spoke, it was always to the point. Everyone respected Nina, and her opinions were taken seriously. It had been three years since she retired, and she hadn't thought of working again until Anna decided to leave the library. Finding a new responsible worker in the village had been challenging, but no one wanted to dissuade Anne either. Everyone understood that if the farm were to fold, it would be tough for everyone in the village. They had been through that phase already. So, the chairman of the village council approached Nina with a request, asking her to take on the responsibilities of the librarian for at least a year. Nina fought it over for a bit and agreed. After all, who else but her? Take your time, Anna, she said instead of a greeting. Oh, I'm sorry, Anna replied, slightly out of breath. I didn't calculate the time properly. I overslept a bit. If you're going to lead our form like this, it won't go well. I understand, Anna replied. Anna wanted to respond to Nina with something sharp. Can you really be so curt with a former school principal? Besides, they would still have to interact a lot because there was plenty of work to be done in the library. Checking all the books against the catalog, waiting for the district committee, and completing all the necessary paperwork took time. In the end, Anna and Nina left the old log library as the sun was already setting. I didn't have time to go to the field today, Anna remarked sadly. I hope Joseph can manage on his own. He'll manage, Nina replied. You can rely on Joseph. He's a good agronomist and a competent manager, but he still needs an assistant. He's not very good with paperwork, and he hasn't learned how to deal with the higher-ups. Can you handle it, Anna? Yes, Nina, I can't let Michael down, she replied softly. That's the right attitude, nodded the former school principal, now the librarian. Then Nina looked at Anna attentively and added in a gentler tone, Dear, would you like to have a cup of tea? Yes, that's a good idea, Anna said a bit flustered. Come to my place. I haven't prepared anything, but we'll think of something. What's there to think about? We have hot water, and that's good enough, Nina replied cheerfully, giving a slight smile. 
Anna looked at her companion with different eyes now. She no longer seemed stern. Somewhere along the day's work, they had even become friends to some extent. Nina wasn't the harsh woman that many in the village called her. She was just an ordinary woman. She smiled kindly, almost like a mother. They entered the house. Anna bustled around in the kitchen while Nina wandered through the rooms. Michael built a great house, the guest remarked, entering the kitchen. Everything is so solid and well made. He was a talented man. And you're an excellent homemaker. It's so cozy here. Who needs this coziness now? Anna replied, barely holding back tears. I don't want to be in the house. Everything reminds me of Michael. Tomorrow morning, I'll go to the office and then to the field. That's good that you're embracing this new endeavor with such enthusiasm. But you shouldn't tear your heart apart. Nina sat down at the table and looked attentively at her hostess. I understand it's hard for you right now, and everything reminds you of your husband. But you're doing it because that's what you want. Anna looked surprised at her guest, and Nina continued. First of all, get rid of all his things, hide them away. Secondly, why is Michael's photo still in the living room? But it's customary. Take down the photo. It's easy for you to say, Nina, Anna sobbed. How can I? It's like betraying him. These things, these photos, they're the only things that warm my soul. You're talking nonsense. Nina frowned, then sighed sadly. Is it easy for me? Do you know what I've been through? And over a cup of tea, the former school principal shared her own story. In her youth, back when she was studying in the city, she got married for the first time. She loved her husband to the point of madness. She was expecting a child from him and was planning to take an academic leave for that reason when tragedy struck her husband was hit by a car. He passed away in the hospital. Nina, on the other hand, had a miscarriage at a late stage of pregnancy. Afterward, the doctors made it clear she would never have children. The young woman was devastated. Her beloved was gone and the meaning of life seemed forever lost. Then her mother came and took Nina to the countryside. Here, she gradually recovered, completed her institute studies through distance learning, and started working at a school. And one day, at a teacher's meeting in the district center, she met Bradley. He taught mathematics in another village, and he was a young and interesting man. Colleagues whispered, he's a widower. His wife died during childbirth, and he's raising his three-year-old son alone. When Nina learned about this, she felt so sorry for Bradley and the little boy. She remembered her own story. After the meeting, they accidentally bumped into Bradley at a local cafe where Nina had stopped for tea. They smiled at each other. Polite Bradley suggested sitting at a nearby table, and they started talking about professional matters. That was the end of their first encounter. Later, they met several more times for work-related matters, and eventually, Bradley came to visit Nina. They had a heartfelt conversation. Bradley's mother also liked Nina. Mina herself realized that she was drawn to Bradley. In short, they celebrated Christmas together as a family of four, Nina, Bradley, his son Ryan, and his mother. They had a wedding in the spring, and since then, Nina and Bradley lived together in harmony. From the very beginning, Ryan started calling Nina mom, and he became her one and only beloved son. Many years have passed, and everything was going well for them. Ryan lived in the city now and was a high-ranking professional. He visited his parents with his wife and two daughters during holidays. Nina adored her grandchildren and eagerly awaited her son's visits. Wow! And exclaimed, I had no idea he wasn't your biological son. No one in the village ever told me anything about this. He's my true son, even though I didn't give birth to him. Nina smiled. People don't talk about it because it's something that's been forgotten. Maybe I became his real mother. Ryan knows everything, but it doesn't matter to him. That's how things turned out. Why did I tell you all of this, Anna? You must understand that life doesn't end with the loss of a loved one. And as she was leaving, Nina repeated the phrase, Anna, life doesn't end. Remember that, as Anna fell asleep, she couldn't help but think about the wise former school principal's words. And when she woke up in the morning, she prepared herself for her new job. Joseph was already in the office when Anna arrived. Happy first work day, Anna. The old agronomist smiled. Are you coming to the fields with me, or will you stay here? I'll stay here, Anna nodded. 
I want to study the documents. That's the right choice, Joseph agreed. I can handle the guys in the fields myself, but I struggle with paperwork. If you have any questions, ask Madeline. Madeline, an experienced accountant who had worked in the office for many years, helped Anna navigate through many issues in a single day. However, it was still clear that Anna's transition from a librarian to a farm manager wouldn't be easy. But all of a sudden, Anna felt a surge of determination and realized that she could do it. After all, there were good people around her who would help if needed. Yes, Michael had chosen the right team. Anna returned home in the evening, tired from dealing with documents, and her head was throbbing a bit from the paperwork. But this didn't shake her confidence as the new leader of the form. She decided to take a short break and spend some time with the papers, just as Michael used to do. Yes, he never did buy that combine. Anna knew she wouldn't have time to arrange the paperwork for a discounted purchase now. But the winter season was ahead, and she needed to figure out how to keep the livestock safe and sound. Her farts were consumed by work as she crossed the threshold of her home. Then a wave of melancholy washed over her again. Once more, she was alone, and Michael's eyes in the photograph in the living room pierced her heart, making her want to cry. Anna remembered Nina's advice about removing all of Michael's belongings, and she decided to follow it. It was time to stop grieving. Setting aside the documents she had brought with her, Anna retrieved two large cardboard boxes from the storage room and began packing everything that reminded her of Michael his possessions, souvenirs, and even his favorite cup with a spoon. The last item she picked up was a portrait with a black ribbon. Goodbye, my love, she whispered and kissed the photograph of her husband before placing it in the box. Anna decided to take all the boxes to the shed that Michael had converted into an office. She took the key, turned on the lights in the shed, and entered it. It was her first time in the shed since Michael had rearranged everything. Her husband had this quirk. He considered this place his territory. Anna mentally apologized to the departed for intruding into his domain. Then, pushing aside all doubts and superstitions, she surveyed the room. She decided to place the boxes on the old cupboard that stood in the corner of this small office. Interestingly, from the inside, the shed indeed resembled a working office. Michael had lined the walls with plasterboard and painted them in a neutral color. He had laid a cheap carpet on the sealed floor. The furniture was old but suitable for a workspace. Michael had been skillful in organizing the space. Anna was surprised and wondered when Michael had managed to set up this office. She had always been busy with something, whether it was the library or household chores. Why hadn't Michael ever bragged about this decent office inside the shed? Why had he never let her in here? Placing the boxes on the cupboard, Anna sat down in thoughtfulness, gazing at the desk and offering a sad smile. There were textbooks on gardening stacked neatly, along with some thick notebooks. Anna picked up one of the notebooks and flipped through it. It turned out Michael had been taking notes and reading. There were also notebooks with what seemed like lecture notes. Apparently, he had taken them from former agronomy students. Anna placed the notebook on the table, pushed it closer to the edge, and then heard something fall from the table. She leaned down to take a closer look. It was a key small, neat, and seemingly belonging to the desk. Driven by curiosity, Anna picked up the key and took a closer look at the writing desk. At first glance, there didn't appear to be any compartments that could be locked. But upon opening the largest cabinet door, she saw a small compartment that was securely closed, and that very key seemed to fit. The lock inside clicked, and Anna froze. Could her husband have hidden something in there that she wasn't supposed to know? After all, they had a safe in the house for all their documents, money, and so on. It was probably just some gardening-related stuff, she thought. Nothing more. That's what Anna decided as she pulled out a small drawer. Inside, there was a rolled-up notebook. Anna picked it up carefully. There were no labels on the cover. She opened the notebook, and from the first lines, she understood that she had stumbled upon a secret, something Michael had kept hidden from her for all of their ten years together. Anna couldn't fathom that her beloved husband, Michael, could be keeping something from her, but the writings told a different story. She read the diary with bated breath, page by page, as if devouring the information. It was Michael's personal diary. It is commonly believed that a man keeping a diary is something shameful or absurd. I used to think the same way, but then I realized that by putting my farts on paper, 
I could at least talk to someone, even if it's just myself. Because I can't share this with the person closest to me, my wife. That's how Michael's diary began. As Anna read her husband's diary, she realized that he had a different life, a different woman. Michael had known Elizabeth, the other woman, since childhood. They attended parallel classes and began their first romantic relationship in the ninth grade. After their graduation party, something happened between them for the first time. Michael deeply loved Elizabeth. He almost worshipped her. He even wanted to enroll in a law school to be with her, but he didn't have the required grades. Fortunately, there was an undersubscription that year at the Technical University, so Michael became a student there. However, he saw Elizabeth less and less, and it saddened him greatly, but she remained quite calm about it. Then, Michael saw her with someone else. A guy pulled up to her doorstep in an expensive car, holding a magnificent bouquet of roses. Elizabeth hung on his neck. At that time, Michael, a simple student, couldn't lavish such gifts on his beloved. But did fancy cars and flowers really matter? He approached them and just looked into Elizabeth's eyes. What do you want? The girl laughed. You're just a friend, and I truly love Max. A friend? Michael asked, swallowing his hurt. What about everything we had? Just an experience. Elizabeth shrugged and hopped into the car with Max. Hey, buddy, did you get it? Her new suitor condescendingly asked Michael. Elizabeth is mine. I wouldn't advise you to approach her again. He too got into the car, and they drove away, leaving Michael standing there, feeling utterly humiliated. Yes, he wanted to shout, to run after them, to throw something at their departing car, but he restrained himself. That evening, he got drunk for the first time in his life, so much that he couldn't remember anything. The next evening, he had a conversation with his father in the kitchen. His father tried to convince him that there would be many more girls like Elizabeth for Michael. His son disagreed. He truly loved her. But his father just sighed and shook his head. Time passed, and Michael no longer sought meetings with Elizabeth. She didn't seek them either. Soon he learned that his ex had married a rich man, the very Max. It hurt him deeply, and he decided that he would never let another woman into his heart like that again. Yes, he had relationships, but nothing binding. He chose simpler girls. After college, Michael ventured into business. Slowly but surely, things were starting to pick up, but on the personal front, everything remained the same. Then he met Anna. Honestly, at first, Michael thought she was just like any other girl. They would dabble in love a bit, and then he would move on. At first glance, Anna didn't captivate Michael in any special way. She was an ordinary girl, an art institute graduate, a future librarian. But then something clicked. Yes, Anna wasn't a beauty like Elizabeth, but Michael realized that he couldn't stop thinking about her. Her beauty wasn't just on the surface. Anna seemed to radiate from within, and her eyes Michael could drown in those deep blue pools. Yet, he still believed it wasn't love. True love was already in his life, and then, one day, he ran into Elizabeth. She and her husband had come to his auto parts store. Her husband, of course, didn't recognize him, but she. Elizabeth pretended not to recognize him. It was only when her husband got distracted, examining the label on some expensive motor oil, that she quietly asked, You live all alone? And she smirked condescendingly. I'm getting married soon, Michael replied immediately. Why did he say that? Probably out of spite. No, he had no intention of marrying Anna. But when Elizabeth heard his answer, she just shrugged. That irritated Michael. Oh, she doesn't care anyway, and neither does he. That same evening, he proposed to Anna. God, how happy that girl was. Michael wrote in his diary. It seemed like she looked at me as if I were a god, and I felt a bit ashamed. I swore my love to her, but there was emptiness inside me. I loved someone else at that time, and later, when I left the registry office with her, and later, when I held her at night. Everything changed when Michael's business encountered its first problems. Anna sincerely cared for him, trying to comfort and support him. That's when he made the first comparison. How would Elizabeth have reacted in this situation? She would have run away without a second thought. But Anna was there, unafraid of poverty or difficulties in the countryside. She was ready to go anywhere with him. 
It was in the countryside that Michael finally realized he truly loved Anna. That's where he saw her true beauty, not just her captivating eyes, but her delicate skin, thick chestnut hair, and slender waist. Or had she become even more beautiful with time? And Anna was an excellent homemaker. She cooked deliciously, their home was always cozy, and she never complained, not even during financial hardships or rural challenges. At night, Michael held her with special tenderness, and during the day, she worked tirelessly. Now, they no longer knew any need. Their home was picture perfect, and Michael was a respected man. Yes, he wanted children very much. If Anna's problems had surfaced at the beginning of their life together, he would have left her without a second thought. But now, he couldn't, because without Anna, his life had no meaning. Then, two years ago, he unexpectedly ran into Elizabeth again. Michael had gone to the city for another batch of spare parts when he suddenly saw her walking down the sidewalk. Yes, he recognized her instantly, even though she had lost some of her usual luster and looked somewhat weary. Michael pulled over. He didn't understand why he did it. Perhaps he wanted his former lover to see his expensive car, and he looked presentable himself. Elizabeth recognized him, and she had indeed changed over the years. Hello, she said hesitantly. Hello, he smiled. Need a ride? Elizabeth agreed, and as they sat in the car, a conversation started. Elizabeth explained that her husband had left her, leaving her with no money, and she hadn't finished college. Now she worked as a cashier in a supermarket. How about you? Elizabeth asked timidly. I'm doing great, Michael replied with a smile. Are you married? Yes, of course. Do you have children? Not yet, Michael replied briefly. Elizabeth fell silent, then burst into tears. Michael was taken aback, pulled the car over, and tried to console her. Then everything seemed hazy, a cheap hotel room, and braces. When Michael realized what he had done, he hastily prepared to leave. The room is paid for a day, he told Elizabeth as he got dressed. You can stay. What about you? She asked, stretching. Now she looked content and happy, and almost as beautiful as before. But Michael couldn't look at her. He felt ashamed in front of his wife. He truly loved Anna, and all of this was just a misunderstanding. I need to go home, Michael replied, not looking her way. Will we meet again? No, forget everything that happened here. How? You can't treat me like this. You always loved only me. Elizabeth cried out. That was a long time ago. And what happened today was a mistake. I love only my wife. Forgive me. Saying this, Michael left the room, leaving Elizabeth in tears. Did he pity her a bit? Yes, a little. And he felt ashamed of his behavior. But on the other hand, now they were even. He tried to forget about this incident, but after some time, Elizabeth called him. She had found his number through mutual acquaintances. Hello, she said to him. I'm pregnant. Congratulations, he replied. But what does that have to do with me? It's your child. Of course, Michael didn't believe her right away and asked Elizabeth not to call him again. However, she didn't calm down and sent him an SMS the next day, saying that she would tell his wife everything. That's when he called her himself. Don't you dare call my wife. He yelled into the phone. I don't know if you're really pregnant with my child or not. What happened between us was a mistake, as I told you. I don't want a child from you, even if it is mine. Then, having ended the conversation, he regretted his words a bit. After all, he and Anna didn't have any children, and there was no chance of having any. But what could he do? Acknowledge Elizabeth's child, but then Anna would find out. He couldn't hurt her. That very evening, he discreetly took Anna's phone and drowned it in the lake. The next day, he bought her a new phone with a new SIM card. This way, he hoped that Elizabeth wouldn't be able to reach Anna. The plan worked. No one bothered Anna. Elizabeth called him only after nine months and informed him that she had indeed given birth to a child. I couldn't bring myself to have an abortion, she explained and chuckled into the phone. I still want a family and children in the future. Let this child struggle. So, you're just letting him struggle? Michael couldn't believe his ears. What did you do with the child? I put him in an orphanage, Elizabeth simply replied. He turned out to be sick. No, if he were healthy, I would have kept him for myself. In court, you would still have been recognized as the father, 
and you would have to pay good child support. But you know, there's not much joy in ruining your life with a sick child. So, goodbye. In which orphanage did you leave him? Michael gritted his teeth. Elizabeth didn't answer anything. She just laughed and hung up. That night, Michael couldn't sleep at all. He was thinking about what to do. He had set up an office in the barn, started studying gardening, and kept pondering. What should he do now? Here, he could calmly think about everything. He needed an outlet to confess, and he began writing this diary. He described the past and contemplated the future. He couldn't share his farts with anyone else. He was afraid to lie to his wife, and it was bet not to gossip with the men in the village. What were the men like? Sometimes they were even worse gossips than the most talkative woman. In the end, Michael decided to search for Elizabeth's abandoned child. Yes, it was difficult, but small bribes at the city maternity hospital and the guardianship department helped. He found out where the boy was. He was already six months old, and no one was in a hurry to adopt him. The reason was that the child had serious heart problems. At just six months old, he had already undergone one operation, and another one was needed, but it was expensive. Even if Michael sold all his property, he probably wouldn't have enough money to cover the cost. Meanwhile, he did a genetic test and found out that the child was his. But what should he do now? He hadn't confessed his affair to Anna before, so now shocking her with news of a seriously ill son was out of the question. Michael decided to keep it a secret. He just regularly sent money for his sin's treatment to the same shelter, while he searched for ways to find the money for the necessary operation. Yes, it became financially challenging, and the household had to stay afloat. Anna couldn't find out about this additional expense. So, Michael worked tirelessly. It was tough, but he managed. Only one night, his heart couldn't take it anymore. Michael's diary ended with these words. I felt kind of bad today, like a stabbing pain in my heart. When I imagine that my Philip might feel the same way, it tears me apart. I'm a grown man, but he's just a little one. Well, I found a fund that might help my boy, and I'll definitely find a way to convince Anna to take him in. Yes, my wife won't know he's mine right away. Maybe one day, I'll confess to her, but not now. With that, the diary ended. Anna reread the last sentences several times, tears streaming down her cheeks. He truly loved her. Yes, only her. And that poor child as well. Oh, how hard it was for Michael. Why didn't he confess everything to her? Perhaps, together they could have found a way to help the child more quickly. Yes, the child was from his lover, but he was still his son. He stayed silent, suffering because of his infidelity and tearing his own heart apart. And now he was gone. Somewhere out there lived a little boy with a sick heart. Anna cried and realized more and more that she didn't resent her husband, Michael, for Elizabeth. It was a mistake, an obsession, a ghost from the past, if you will. Michael, Michael, Anna whispered. How could you? Why did you pity me? I'm strong. I could have handled your betrayal. But you couldn't live with it. But I promise you, I won't abandon our son. For some reason, this unknown child had already become Anna's own, a part of her family, and she was determined to save the little one. At night, she dreamt again that she was cradling the baby. Now Anna knew the child's name was Philip, and she could even see his face. Strangely enough, the baby resembled Michael. In the morning, Anna woke up, washed up, got dressed quickly, and headed to the city. From her husband's diary, she knew which orphanage Philip was in, so that's where she was going. The guard at the shelter explained how to find the director, Samira. Are you Michael's wife? Samira asked, somewhat incredulously when Anna introduced herself. Why didn't he come himself? I'm his widow. Anna said softly. Oh, my goodness! Samir exclaimed, clasping her hands. What a tragedy! What happened? Anna explained the situation. It seems to be hereditary of Philip. Samira paused, unsure if she should say more. I know that my late husband's son is in this shelter. I am not his mother, but I want to help him. Can you tell me what needs to be done? So, you want to pay for the second surgery. I know Michael intended to do it, but the amount is enormous. Have you found the money? Not yet. I don't know all the details. My husband didn't tell me anything, but I want to finish what he started. 
The child is innocent and shouldn't suffer. You are right, Samer agreed. I'll tell you everything I know. Michael found one foundation, but they can only provide a portion of the money for the child's treatment. Samira shared the details, provided the foundation's contact information, and then suddenly asked, Would you like to see the child? I would, Annie admitted. Is it possible? It's not usually allowed, but I think we can make an exception. Soon, Anna stood by Philip's grip. The baby was asleep. Anna's heart constricted. Yes, this child seemed to come straight from her dreams. The baby stirred, opened his eyes, and let out a whimper. Once again, Anna felt a deep connection with him. She saw Michael in the child's eyes. A nanny approached to tend to the baby, and Anna, along with Samira, made her way to the exit. I will find a way to help Philip, Anna said before parting ways. After visiting the shelter, Anna went to her parents' house. She didn't hide anything and told them about Philip, explaining the details of the foundation as well. She also shared her thoughts that they might have to sell the farm in the future. Most importantly, she expressed her desire to adopt the child. Have you lost your mind completely? Her mother exclaimed. This isn't your child, and you've decided to sacrifice everything for this. How will you survive on a librarian's salary? Mind you, you've already lost your place in the village, and you haven't found one in the city yet. Didn't you persistently invite me to the city after Michael's death? Anna reminded her. I did, but not with someone else's child. This child is Michael's, conceived in infidelity. Betrayal to you. Mom, I know he regretted everything. Besides, you know my problems. And this child is from someone I loved, but now he can't help you in any way. How will you manage alone with a child, without money? I'll figure it out somehow. I'm shocked, her mother exclaimed, even more angered, and called her father from the other room. Dad, you have to talk some sense into her. She's doing the right thing, her father responded, appearing in the kitchen a few seconds later. I liked Michael. People make mistakes. Who doesn't? And women like Elizabeth. They don't inspire jealousy. They inspire contempt. So, daughter, do what you think is right. Your mother and I will support you. Anna's mother let out a heavy sigh at her father's response but remained silent. In the end, they decided everything for her. And perhaps it was the right decision. Anna hadn't planned to adopt Philip until recently. She had thought she couldn't love a child who wasn't her own. But when she saw Philip at the orphanage, so small and vulnerable, her heart trembled. It didn't matter who had given birth to him. She would be his mother, caring for him, looking after him, and loving him. From her parents, Anna went to Michael's parents. They were surprised to see their former daughter-in-law on their doorstep, then hurried to prepare the table for her. You don't need to do anything, Anna stopped them. I have a serious matter to discuss with you. Did you know that Michael had another child? Where did you hear that? Her mother-in-law asked, bewildered. I've never heard of it. Anna proceeded to tell them about Elizabeth. Michael's parents listened, then admitted that Christopher existed before their son's marriage but had chosen to keep it a secret, as the situation had been very painful for Michael. So, this Elizabeth has gotten involved in his life again, her father-in-law grumbled. What a curse. Anna, you're doing the right thing, her mother-in-law said. And thank you for telling us about our grandson. Now we have reason to keep going. Let's save the boy together. Don't doubt for a moment. That day, Anna stayed overnight at her late husband's parents' house. The next morning, she went to the hospital to learn more from the doctors about Philip's condition. The doctor explained that the child needed another surgery. We have a maximum of three months before he starts crawling and walking actively, the doctor said. After that, the strain on his heart will increase, and the outcome could be dire. Can't this surgery be performed under the quota system? Anna asked, although she already knew the answer. Yes, the doctor confirmed, there was a quota, but Philip would never get it in the regular queue. Are you related to the child? He inquired. Though Anna already knew the doctor couldn't disclose information to outsiders. Not yet, but I hope it's temporary. What do you mean? I want to adopt Philip. You do understand that he'll be a challenging child, perhaps, and it seems the expensive surgery won't be the last. I understand all that. From the hospital, Anna drove to the very foundation she had hoped would help. However, the girl there said, the sum is too large and the waiting list is immense. 
All the children need urgent assistance. So, in complete bewilderment, Anna returned to the village. By evening, when she arrived at Joseph's house, he had just returned from the fields. Seeing the new landlady, he furrowed his brow. Anna looked particularly worn out. Joseph, I'll have to sell the farm, she said with a sigh. Then she proceeded to tell the estate manager the story of Philip. Joseph listened, shaking his head. It's a tough situation, he remarked. Of course, you can sell everything, and the estate with all its property is worth much more. But Anna, you can't do anything right now. It'll take about half a year for you to establish inheritance rights. Yes, you're right. I completely forgot about that, Anna admitted, feeling utterly lost. This is Michael's son. How can I abandon him? He's so little. Joseph pondered for a moment. If there was time, we could wait until late autumn and sell the harvest at a higher price to the middlemen. But almost all of it is already gone. And what about seeds for the next season? How will we feed the livestock through the winter? Slaughter all the dairy herd? Can we really do that? Anna, are you sure this child is Michael's? He asked cautiously. Absolutely. I found a certificate from a genetics laboratory in his documents. Unbelievable. Yes, it surprised me too, Anna replied, her voice breaking. Don't worry, dear. Joseph comforted Anna, giving her a hug and patting her on the shoulder. It hurts, all of this. I see you're trying, learning, and enduring, but in the end, he's still a child, born as a result of your husband's betrayal. No, you're not jealous. It's just hurtful, regardless. It's painful from every angle, Anna confessed. I'm struggling with it. I find out things, I go through it, and yet, deep down, he's just a child. Michael's child. How can I abandon him? Don't worry too much, dear. Your heart will find peace. You're doing the right thing by rushing to help that little one. Don't fret too much, girl. We'll figure something out. Maybe we can even save the estate. Joseph wasn't bluffing. Soon, all the farmers in the area knew that the late Michael had a sick son. The men organized fundraisers themselves, involved their acquaintances, and slowly but surely, money started to accumulate. Anna, who was constantly torn between the village and her trips to the city hospital, became exhausted beyond measure. She was grateful to the people who were helping the boy, but it was just a drop in the ocean. Michael's parents didn't stay on the sidelines either. They even took out a loan to help their grandson, but the money was still insufficient. Then, one day, Anna's mother, Amanda, came to the village. She had initially been skeptical but realized she couldn't stop her daughter's determination. She arrived at the end of September, just as Anna returned from work and saw her mother. Mom, Anna exclaimed, surprised, and then paled. Did something happen to Dad? No, your father is fine, her mother replied, shaking her head. I'm here to help you. I'm sorry for not accepting this situation at first. You know, I have a tough character. I wouldn't have forgiven the betrayal, but you're different. I see that you're fighting for this little one. Relatives were calling me, telling me they had seen the boy. He truly resembles Michael. And indeed, the child is blameless. Mom, what's the point of all these words? Anna responded with slight irritation. She was exhausted from a long day's work and the calls from the clinic. And now her mother had arrived, probably once again ready to lecture her. What's all this for? Amanda replied and opened a small purse. From it, she took out an old jewelry box. Anna had never seen it before, but Amanda placed it on the table and opened it. When Anna peered inside, her eyes widened. The box contained antique jewelry rings, bracelets, earrings. Is this gold? She could only manage to ask her mother. Gold? Amanda subtly smiled and the earrings have real emeralds. Mom, where did such splendor come from? We've always lived modestly. You're just a school teacher. Dad worked at the factory his whole life, and as far as I remember, our grandparents were simple laborers. Yes, we come from humble stock, Amanda nodded. But your great-grandmother, in her youth, worked in the house of a wealthy merchant. Then, with the changing regime, the merchant managed to flee to England, and she helped him gather his belongings before his departure. So, when everything was loaded onto the cart, men with pitchforks and axes came to the house. The merchant and his family had just managed to jump into that very cart. The coachman cracked the whip, but perhaps too forcefully, and the horse, in pain and fear, 
galloped as fast as it could. Some items flew out of the cart during the escape. She almost lost the small pouch from her grasp. She wanted to return it, but by then, the enraged men were chasing them. So, they left. Your great-grandmother discreetly stashed that pouch under a bush nearby. When the men went into the house to rummage through things, she managed to retrieve it, and she took it home with her. Only later did she realize how tightly the merchant's wife held onto it. These were her jewels. At the time, she was afraid that she'd be accused of aiding the merchants, guilty by association. But then she decided that she'd let the owners come for their belongings. She genuinely intended to return them. However, years went by, and she married a good man. One day, she confessed to him that she possessed a real treasure. Her husband scolded her, asking why she didn't immediately return it to the new authorities. But now, how could she explain where it came from? So, he scolded her, and then he buried that jewelry box in an iron barrel in the garden beneath an apple tree. It remained there for many years. Then, the war came, and her husband went off to the front. She struggled to survive in the city with her daughter. Times were tough. One day, she decided to make use of the treasure. She dug up the box, selected some less conspicuous pieces, and exchanged them for food at the market. But a week later, she learned that her husband had died. She cried, blaming herself, thinking it was because she took something that wasn't hers, even though her own belongings were taken from her. She reburied the jewelry box and never retrieved it again. Shortly before her death, she told her daughter about the treasure buried beneath the apple tree but strictly instructed her never to use that wealth since it was considered stolen property. Amanda's mother had remembered her own mother's words throughout her life, and she had only shared the story of the jewelry box with her daughter before her own death. Once again, she emphasized the importance of not touching the jewelry. What if the rightful owners showed up one day, and no one must speak of it to avoid trouble? Amanda had always felt a superstitious fear associated with that box. At their country house, she often cast glances at the spot where the apple tree had once grown. What treasures might be hidden there? For a long time, she didn't tell her husband to prevent any temptation to use the treasure. What if it was indeed cursed? Eventually, she confessed to her husband. Jonathan laughed for a long time, dismissing it as a fantasy. However, one day he went to the country house, dug up the rusty barrel, and found the very jewelry box. Amanda scolded him vehemently for his actions and insisted on burying it again. When Anna told her mother about Michael's son, Amanda immediately thought of the jewelry but scolded herself for even thinking of using it. She had no right. However, recently, she had a strange dream. She was walking through a field with blooming flowers, dragonflies buzzing around, and the sun shining brightly a picturesque scene. Suddenly, she heard a commotion overhead, a cry. Anna looked up, and there was a white bird flying with something clutched in its talons. A hawk circled nearby, screeching loudly. The white bird doved downward like a stone, brushed against Amanda's wing, and released what looked like a small box at her feet. Save it, she heard a voice say. It's yours, as if the bird had spoken. Amanda woke up and couldn't understand the meaning of this dream. She told her husband about it, and Jonathan chuckled, suggesting that she watch fewer fantastical movies. But then, they exchanged glances and paled as they realized the significance of the dream. Maybe it's time, Amanda hesitantly asked. Who knows? Maybe it is, Jonathan shrugged. But what if the jewelry is cursed and brings no good? Amanda, you know how much Anna is suffering. We feel for the little boy. What if it helps? Besides, I think your grandmother was more responsible for any curse. The death of your grandfather, it wasn't the fault of the jewelry. You know how many people perished during those times. Amanda agreed with her husband. They went to the country house the next day and dug up the jewelry box. Then Amanda visited her daughter. Now, sitting at the spacious kitchen table with her daughter, they discussed their next steps. To be honest, Mom, you surprised me. Anna shook her head. I don't believe in curses, and these jewels could indeed help save Philip. But how do we use them? We'll need to find a way to sell them. I'm thinking the same thing, dear. We need to find a trustworthy person. Do you have anyone in mind? Anna shrugged. She didn't really have anyone in mind, except maybe Joseph, Michael's loyal helper and friend. He shouldn't let them down. 
The following morning, after seeing her mother off at the bus stop, Anna headed to the office. Joseph was having a heated discussion with the accountant in his office. Hello, Anna. Hello, Anna replied and glanced questioningly at Joseph. We need to talk. Come to my office. The manager obediently followed his employer. Once in Anna's office, she shared with him her family's secret and asked for his help in selling the treasure. It should be enough for Philip's treatment and to clear all our debts, she concluded her story, looking at Joseph with a questioning expression. Can you help us, Joseph? We need to find the right person. I understand we could just turn it in like a treasure and get our 25%, but how much time would that take? Philip needs surgery urgently. Joseph promised to help, and within a couple of days, he informed Anna that he had found the right person. Together, they went to the city to visit a jeweler who examined the contents of the box and promised his assistance. Just two days later, Anna received a substantial sum of money. It would cover Philip's surgery and their ongoing household expenses. Anna didn't inquire about the buyer of the jewelry. It was none of her concern. The jeweler mentioned that a very wealthy individual had purchased them. Anna hoped that whoever owned them now would put them to good use, while she focused on saving Philip. Soon, the operation for the little boy was performed at one of the city clinics, and he quickly recovered. By New Year's, Anna was able to bring Philip home legally. She adopted him as her own child, although the child welfare authorities had suggested she obtain legal guardianship for financial benefits. Anna firmly believed that Philip was her child and she could raise him herself, without any support from the government. She was confident she could manage, as it wasn't about the money. Three years passed, and Anna and Philip lived in the countryside. During this time, Anna became adept at running the farm and managed her affairs confidently. Joseph, her faithful assistant, remained by her side. The form was thriving, and people worked diligently. Anna was content, and she knew her husband would be proud of her. Michael would have been delighted to know that Philip was now with Anna, alive and well. Philip attended daycare, and he was a bright and lively little boy. Anna couldn't have been prouder of her son. Philip enjoyed reading poetry and enthusiastically sang songs during morning gatherings at daycare. He was always the most active and the most artistic. Anna cherished her sin's achievements, and Philip adored his mother. He often picked flowers from the garden to present to her, despite the numerous scraped knees he endured while chasing bitter flies to catch as gifts for his mom. Anna never scolded him for the flowers. Instead, she would sigh and smile. She would tend to his scraped knees, blowing gently on the wounds, and he would patiently endure, wrinkling his face in annoyance. After all, he never actually caught a butterfly, but he knew how happy it made his mom. When you see a beautiful butterfly, just call me, and we'll admire it together, she would tell him. Philip nodded in understanding. Oh, how many times Anna chased butterflies with him. Not all of them were as beautiful as he thought, but Anna would exclaim in awe, whether it was a cabbage white or a common moat. Philip would smile, happy to have pleased his mom. Anna lived for her son, and he was her sole focus. She paid no attention to men, even though other farmers and local officials often noticed the young and attractive farmer. For a while, the head of the district showed particular interest in her. Anna didn't know how to decline his advances without offending him or making an enemy. If only he were a young, unmarried man, but he was already past 60 and had grandchildren. Joseph helped out then, several times, in front of the district head, he would take Anna's arm or whisper something in her ear. She understood her devoted manager's message and played along. Eventually, the district head interpreted it in his own way, thinking that the young farmer was already taken. As he had a friendly relationship with Joseph, he decided not to interfere further. Over time, he became less interested, and there was no need for Anna and Joseph to pretend to be secret lovers anymore. Anna had no use for anyone else in her life. Philip grew up in love and care. Michael's parents often visited them to see their grandson, and occasionally Anna's parents stopped by as well. The little boy was showered with attention and affection. Only occasionally did the five-year-old ask his mother, Where's my dad? Our dad is in the sky. Anna would sigh and hug her son. The boy would look up at the sky, trying to understand where his dad might be hiding and why. After all, other kids had their dads nearby. 
This was the only cloud on Philip's otherwise sunny existence. Don't be sad, my little one, Anna would tell him. I'm right here. And the little boy would tightly hug her around the neck. Mom, I love you so much. Philip would whisper in her ear, and she would embrace him. In those moments, she was the happiest woman in the world. Being a mom was the most important thing to her. Often, after putting Philip to bed, Anna would sit by the window and gaze at the stars. She would remember her past life with Michael. Yes, they had been happy, and it still hurt a little that he was no longer there and would never be again. Perhaps Anna would have gone mad if Philip hadn't miraculously appeared in her life. Yes, on one hand, she should have been angry with her husband, accusing him of betrayal. On the other hand, was it really betrayal? Anna was grateful, grateful to her husband for his mistake. It was that mistake that allowed her to become a mother, even if it happened in an unconventional way. Anna was even grateful to Elizabeth for leaving the baby at the orphanage. Otherwise, she would never have met Philip. Now he was her most dear, most beloved, the most everything. It happened in mid-November on a day off. The first snow had fallen. Anna had prepared dough for pies early in the morning. When Philip woke up, the house was already filled with the aroma of delicious pastries. Pies, the boy asked, peering into the kitchen, rubbing his sleepy eyes. Pies, Anna smiled, taking a tray of fluffy apple pies out of the oven. Your favorites, with apples. Go wash up and sit at the table. Philip didn't need to be asked twice. He quickly ran to the bathroom, and soon his bare feet could be heard padding back. Anna listened with a smile. When her son appeared in the kitchen, freshly washed and even combed, she deliberately frowned. Why are you walking barefoot on the cold floor? Who's going to cough now? Not me. Philip declared, climbed onto a stool, and then added with a hopeful tone, Mom, can we go outside after breakfast? There's snow. Yes, winter has arrived. Anna maintained her stance. But do you want forgiveness? Oh, Mom, the boy pouted. I want to build a snowman. All right, we'll build one. But first, we need to eat our pies. Philip grinned with joy and swung his bare feet back and forth on the stool. Anna sighed, fetched a pair of slippers for her son, and slipped them onto his feet. Then she kissed him. They enjoyed breakfast together, and after finishing, they got ready to go outside. The backyard was a winter wonderland. Fluffy snowflakes covered everything, trees, fences, buildings, it seemed like everything was enveloped in a lace blanket. Simultaneously, it felt warm, and the snow on the ground was soft and malleable. Anna and her son built snowmen, occasionally pelting each other with snowballs. They laughed and played. Unnoticed by them, a dark foreign car had parked near their house, and a man around 35 years old had gotten out. He watched Anna and Philip playing with a smile before opening the gate. When Anna heard the click of the latch, she turned her head and raised an eyebrow in surprise. She didn't know this man. Excuse me, are you Anna? The man asked uncertainly. Yes. And who are you? Anna replied cautiously. I. How should I put it? An heir. An heir. Anna was surprised. What do you inherit in my house? No, you didn't quite understand me. The man stammered. I came to talk to you about the jewelry. Anna paled slightly. She was ready to deny everything, but the man spoke before her. No, no, don't think I have any claims against you. I just want to know. But first, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Christopher. I'm the great-grandson of the merchant. Upon hearing the name of the merchant whose jewel Rihanna had sold several years ago, the woman turned even paler, and the man, noticing her reaction, hurried to explain. Christopher was born and raised in the capital. His parents had told him the story of his great-grandfather, who had lived in a small town and worked as a merchant. Eventually, they had to flee with their entire family to escape the new regime. Their plan was to reach England, but they lacked the finances. The merchant had hoped to use his wife's jewelry to cross the border, but she couldn't save them when they were fleeing their estate. So, they had to hide in Siberia. For several years, he lived with his family in the forest, hiding from the authorities. But they were eventually found, though by then, the great-grandfather was gravely ill and soon passed away. The new regime did not persecute the widow. In fact, they invited her to work in the collective farm. Later, her children worked in the same collective farm, and through honest labor, the family proved their reliability. 
Much happened in Christopher's life thereafter. Eventually, his father was able to leave for the capital, where he studied, got married, and started a family of his own. Christopher himself knew very little about his ancestors, except for a vague family legend that there had been some precious jewelry in his great-grandfather's possession. Christopher pursued a career in history and became a professor at one of the capital's universities. One day, during an exam, an unusual incident occurred. One of the students couldn't answer the simplest question. Christopher shook his head in disappointment and told her that she'd have to retake the exam, and this time, before the committee. The girl burst into tears and suddenly reached for her earrings, taking them off and placing them in front of the professor. These are rare earrings, she tearfully said. Please, take them, but give me a passing grade, please. Christopher looked at the distressed girl with anger, ready to reject the bribe when he noticed an engraving on the earrings. Memories of his father's stories and his family history rushed back to him. Curious, he asked the student where she got the earrings. After calming down a bit, she explained that her father had given them to her. He had bought them at a high price at an auction. Christopher was intrigued. Could these be the same jewelry that his great-grandmother had lost? He asked the student for her father's phone number, gave her the passing grade she wanted, and took possession of the earrings. Don't give away such valuable gifts so easily, he advised her as she left. The ecstatic girl happily left the classroom, and Christopher immediately called her father to inquire about the auction. Later, he went to visit the jewelry's owner, who turned out to be a jeweler. Gradually, he gathered all the information and eventually learned about Anna. Do you want money? Anne asked when she understood what Christopher was looking for. To be honest, I wouldn't refuse. Christopher smiled. But mainly, I came here to find out how these pieces of jewelry ended up with you. Anna then shared her story, though not all the details, focusing on how she had used the jewelry to finance her son's life-saving operation after her husband's death. Well, I'm pleased to know that these pieces of jewelry helped save your son's life. Christopher smiled. Now I'm absolutely certain that this is not a made-up tale but a true story. You don't have to worry. I won't ask for anything from you. You did the right thing. As for the jewelry, let them bring joy to someone else now. I lived without them, and I'll continue to do so. Anna looked at her guest with surprise. What a noble person he was. She invited him into her home and served him pastries and tea. Philip was by her side the entire time. You have a charming little boy, Christopher remarked. I think he takes after you. Anna blushed slightly and smiled. Of course, Philip didn't resemble her. He looked more and more like Michael as he grew older, but that didn't diminish his significance as the most beloved person in Anna's life. Christopher stayed a while longer, thanked Anna for her warm welcome, and bid her farewell. Anna spent the rest of the day pondering. What an eccentric person, she thought. He traveled hundreds of kilometers just to learn about the past, and so noble, too. He could have demanded money from Anna, but he didn't. Winter passed, and spring arrived, filled with its tinkling and bustling. The village came to life as people busied themselves in their yards and gardens. Anna worked tirelessly, often staying late into the night, whether at the office, in the fields, or on trips to the district center. Philip attended kindergarten in the morning, and in the evenings, a neighbor would pick him up as per their agreement. The neighbor found it easy and enjoyable to look after the little boy. Her own children had long moved to the city, and her grandchildren visited only once a year. She cherished the time spent with Philip. One day, after kindergarten, the neighbor brought Philip to her house, where she engaged him in another coloring activity. She then headed to the garden to plant some carrots. Suddenly, the neighbor noticed a taxi stopping near Anna's house. A slim, young blonde woman stepped out of the car and confidently walked toward the yard. Who are you looking for? The grandmother called out. Anna is still in the fields. In the fields, the stranger pursed her lips. I see. Can I help you with something? No, I'll come back another time. The stranger got back into the taxi, which promptly sped away down the dusty road. The neighbor didn't even get a chance to ask who she was and why she had come. When Anna returned to pick up her son, the neighbor relayed everything to her. A blonde, Anna was surprised. I have no idea who that could be. Well, I guess we'll find out next time. A month passed. After the planting season, there was a brief respite for the villagers, and Anna finally had a chance to relax. 
One day, she decided to take Philip to the lake for a swim. They had just stepped out the door when they encountered a woman on the path. She was tall, slender, beautiful, with light hair. Anna immediately recognized her as the same blonde woman the neighbor had mentioned. But who was she? I'm Elizabeth, Philip's mother, the woman said without greeting. She didn't even glance at the boy standing beside Anna. The guest fixed her gaze on Anna, leaving her perplexed. Why have you come? Anna asked quietly. I want to take my son, Elizabeth replied, smirking. After all, I'm the one who gave birth to him. Philip had overheard the entire conversation, though he didn't fully understand it. He kept shifting his gaze between his mother and the beautiful stranger. Anna, regaining her composure, sent her son inside, promising that they would go to the lake a bit later, and now she needed to speak with their guest. Philip obediently went inside, took out his toy cars, and began playing, creating a noisy racetrack. Anna, her anxiety under control, invited Elizabeth into the garden pavilion. Elizabeth nodded in agreement, walked along the path to the pavilion, and settled into a seat. Looking around appreciatively, you have a nice place here, she remarked. Did Michael build all of this, or was it you? That's not important, Anna replied evenly. Please, enlighten me about the purpose of your visit. I already told you. I want to take my son. Elizabeth gave Anna a scrutinizing look. What on earth did Michael see in you, she remarked. Apparently, something you didn't possess, Anna replied in a measured tone. She continued, and why did you assume you have any claim to my son? I found out everything. You adopted him from an orphanage, even if that's true. No court will give you the child. You rightly pointed out that I adopted Philip after you abandoned him at the maternity hospital. I didn't have the money to treat him, Elizabeth said, her voice slightly shrill. And it's not your place to lecture me on how to live. I'm not lecturing. I'm just not giving up my son. Leave here. She stood her ground, facing Elizabeth with her arms crossed. She was resolute. At any moment, she might grab this audacious woman by the collar and throw her out of the yard. Why do you need someone else's child? Elizabeth taunted with a smirk. Can't you have your own? That's none of your business. He is my child and my husband's. Oh, come on. Elizabeth laughed heartily. I'm particularly amused by how you say my child. How is he yours? Besides, Michael has nothing to do with him. That's where you're mistaken. Anna smirked too. Michael had a paternity test done. I saw the results myself. He is Philip's father. That's not the truth, Elizabeth said, crossing her legs comfortably. She went on to tell Anna how it really was. By the time she had slept with Michael, she was already pregnant. The term was short, and the child's father immediately distanced himself. Then Michael appeared, successful and self-assured, even though he was married. But Elizabeth was convinced that Michael would believe her. After all, he couldn't have forgotten his first true love her, Elizabeth. Michael, noble as he was, wouldn't abandon a pregnant woman. Yet, he began talking about his love for his wife and how his night with Elizabeth had been a mistake. Maybe Elizabeth wouldn't have given in so easily, but then the real father of the child showed up again. He, too, was a wealthy man. Perhaps everything would have worked out between them, but he tragically died in an accident, and Elizabeth was left alone, carrying the child under her heart. She felt sorry for herself. Everyone had deceived her. Why did she need this child now? She needed to survive in this cruel world. But when the hospital informed her that the child had health problems, her decision was final. She decided to give up the baby, but her resentment toward Michael remained. She told him she had given birth to his child and abandoned the baby. Why? Just to torment this noble gentleman, to make him suffer, maybe even go bankrupt. Elizabeth knew how much the surgery cost. It was a fortune. Michael had to sell everything to save the child. Yes, she was sure that Michael would look for his son, and he did. A friend of Elizabeth's worked as a nurse in the very same orphanage. She later told Elizabeth that Michael had shown up. She also informed Elizabeth that he had a DNA test done. Dealing with the test was the easiest part. There was only one laboratory in the city, and her friend worked there. Elizabeth persuaded her friend to substitute the test, claiming she wanted to win Michael back, but in reality, she no longer needed him, or the child for that matter. By then, she had met a new suitor, 
a wealthy Italian man twice her age, but that was beside the point. Elizabeth watched from a distance as Michael took care of the infant, searched for money, and waited to see how it would all end. And then, somehow, it didn't matter to her anymore. The wealthy Italian asked her to marry him, and Elizabeth flew to Milan. She celebrated, finally, everything in her life had fallen into place. She could forget about poverty, men's grievances, and even that child. She had a new life. Anna listened to Elizabeth and couldn't believe that all of this was true. So, Michael had also been deceived, and Philip wasn't his son. Of course, Elizabeth's words could be doubted, but they seemed closer to the truth. Anna saw that Philip, as he grew up, became less and less like Michael. He hadn't looked much like him from the start. She had convinced herself that Philip was a carbon copy of Michael, and Michael's parents wanted to believe it too. But Philip didn't resemble Elizabeth either. So, there must have been someone else. Oh, my God. Philip wasn't Michael's son. The realization brought tears to Anna's eyes. She could barely contain her emotions and calmly asked, Why do you need the child now? A lot has changed, Elizabeth replied. She stared audaciously at Anna, squinting slightly. It turns out my husband wants a child, but he has issues. And as it turns out, I can't have more children. We even considered adopting. But then I confessed that I had a biological child. We thought it would be better for him to live with us. Elizabeth didn't tell Anna about her Italian husband's anger when he found out that his beloved wife had once given birth and abandoned her own child. He even wanted a divorce because of it. Elizabeth begged him to forgive her, and he agreed, but on one condition, she had to go and return with the child. She had no choice, so Elizabeth agreed. Back in her homeland, she learned about Michael's death and that his wife had adopted a boy. Elizabeth was relieved that the child had received surgery, as it meant she wouldn't have to deal with that issue anymore. Besides, Philip wasn't needed in her life. But she couldn't afford to lose her husband, and her feelings didn't matter in this situation. Rowan was wealthy, and that was what mattered most. Anna stared in bewilderment at the audacious guest. What Elizabeth had said about Philip was shocking, but regardless, Philip remained her son. Even if he wasn't Michael's biological child, he was still the dearest and closest to her heart. She would not give her child to this woman. Get out of my house, or I will call the police, Anna firmly declared, pointing Elizabeth toward the path leading to the gate. Don't be so sure, Elizabeth shrugged. The child is mine. Any DNA test will confirm that. I'll find good lawyers, and they will get Philip back for me. No court in the world would agree to that. You abandoned a sick and defenseless child. You went on with your personal life while he struggled with his health. You didn't care whether he lived or died. You lived your life in Italy, feeling great. But Philip was with me all this time. I am his mother. All right, goodbye, mother, Elizabeth sneered, adding, for now, farewell. I will definitely come back for my son, and she left. The engine started behind the gates, the car door slammed shut, and the vehicle drove away, taking the unwelcome guest with it. Anna sat in the gazebo, her mood thoroughly spoiled. Philip wasn't Michael's son. This thought consumed her consciousness. She didn't notice when Philip ran out of the house and headed toward her. The little boy approached and hugged Anna by the shoulders. Did I scare you, mom? The boy worriedly asked. No, my dear. I was just lost in thought. Anna smiled and hugged her son tightly. Mom, where's that lady? She left. What did she want? Oh, sweetheart. We were just discussing some work matters. Anna improvised on the spot. She thought for a moment and added, Son, if that lady ever shows up at our house or you see her on the street, never go with her and don't talk to her under any circumstances. Mommy, is she a bad lady? A very bad one. Remember that. Don't go with her. The little boy nodded in agreement and immediately reminded his mother about going to the lake. Of course, my darling, let's go swimming. That's what we planned, after all, Anna said, regaining her composure. Holding her sin's hand tightly, she headed down the path through the garden. Beyond the garden, there lay a clear and transparent lake. The locals loved to relax here. Anna and Philip would swim and sunbathe by its shores. Gradually, Anna's emotions settled within her, and on their way back home, she pondered what had actually changed. Yes, 
it was a pity that Michael turned out not to be Philip's father, although this Elizabeth wasn't trustworthy. But even if that were the case, she loved her son, and she wouldn't give him to anyone. Elizabeth had no rights to him. The only question was how to tell Michael's parents that Philip wasn't their biological grandchild. Anna understood that this information could hurt Michael's elderly parents. They had lived with thoughts of their beloved grandson, their flesh and blood. And what would it mean now? There was nothing left after their son. Anna decided not to say anything to Michael's parents, and in fact, she didn't tell anyone. She hoped that this audacious person would not reappear in her life or her son's life. And so, they walked back home from the lake, the sun warmly embracing their shoulders, a gentle breeze blowing, and somewhere in the bushes, a cricket chirped merrily. Anna held her son's hand tightly, and Philip chattered away like a child. She listened, nodded in response, all the while lost in her farts. Mom? Mom? Suddenly, she heard Philip's voice. What? Sweetheart, she shook her head, as if chasing away troubling farts. You're not listening to me, are you? Philip pouted. Oh, no, my little one, I am listening. I was just lost in thought for a moment. I am sorry, what were you saying? I said that I love you very much, and I love you too. Anna sat down in front of her son, hugging him tightly. Her heart swelled with joy, her precious and dearest son. No one would take him away from her. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was returning to the city. Sitting in the taxi, she mentally worked out a plan on how to retrieve Philip. In truth, Philip held no interest for her. She had only glimpsed him there, in the village, and only noted that he resembled his late father, who had died in an accident. She fondly remembered Anna's reaction when she found out about the fake DNA test. Anna had tried to appear calm but almost burst into tears. Elizabeth found it amusing and satisfying. She had managed to hurt her rival. After all, Michael had chosen her back then. So now, let him deal with the consequences. But how could she get Philip back? Elizabeth understood that she would face difficulties in court. Even the most skilled lawyer would be hesitant to take on such a case. She had hoped that Anna would voluntarily give up the child upon learning the truth. But that hadn't worked out. Anna had become attached to the child. Something needed to be done. Elizabeth had been thinking and planning for a month, ever since that first trip to the village when she didn't find Anne at home. And now the encounter had taken place. Action was needed. In the city, Elizabeth stayed in the most expensive hotel suite. She could afford it. Rowan hadn't imposed any restrictions on her finances so far. Of course, she could have stayed in her mother's apartment, where she had grown up. But the thought of her past life disgusted her. She had a new life now and she would fight to keep it. Elizabeth didn't even call her mother to announce her arrival. She considered it unnecessary. Sentimentality was of no use to her. During the month she had spent in the city, Elizabeth preferred to revel in her superiority. She enjoyed throwing money around, noticing the admiring glances of the staff. After her second trip to the village, she called that same friend you had once helped her with the genetic test. Alexis still worked at the laboratory. Upon hearing her old friend's voice, Alexis tensed slightly. What did she want now? She had tried to forget that story and didn't want to have any more dealings with Elizabeth because she knew that wherever Elizabeth was, trouble followed. But her friend chattered away on the phone, saying that she had just flown in from Milan for a week and wanted to meet up. In the end, Alexis agreed. They met at a cafe, sat down, and had a pleasant conversation while Alexis waited for her friend to get to the point. Finally, Elizabeth was ready. Alexis, would you like to go to Italy? I can introduce you to a very influential man there. My Rowan has a friend. He's over 60, but he looks really good, and he's incredibly wealthy, not to mention a widower. Elizabeth winked conspiratorially. I think he'll like you. We can go shopping together. Relax. So, what do you say? I'm quite happy here. Alexis replied cautiously. Oh, come on. Don't deceive yourself. It's nice here, but look at you. You're a beauty, and men don't appreciate you. Why bother with all the riffraff when there's a real millionaire out there? I'm sure things will work out between you two. Will you fly with me? No, Elizabeth. I won't even consider it. I'm doing just fine here. Okay, it's time for me to go, Alexis said as she got up, but her friend grabbed her hand. Don't you want to marry a millionaire? 
Otherwise, you'll end up in jail. Elizabeth whispered quietly, Sit down. What are you talking about? Alexis paled and obediently sat back down. You haven't forgotten that DNA story, have you? I see you hadn't. Well, I could tell the police everything. They'd be interested, Elizabeth said softly. Why do you need this? You were involved in it yourself. What did I do? Elizabeth mused, letting go of her friend's hand. I could have asked you for something, but I didn't commit any crimes. You did it all. If you recall, I did it all for free. I genuinely believed you wanted to reunite with Michael, Alexis replied in a hushed tone. I was just getting back at him, Elizabeth smiled. But you can't prove any of that, or that I took any money. What do you want? Alexis paled and realized her mistake. She hadn't recorded the conversation beforehand. A recording would have been useful now. Okay, she sighed, thinking, I'll try to help you, but afterward, forget my phone number and forget I ever existed. The next day, however, she still called Elizabeth. There's someone who might be able to help you, but I'm not sure, Alexis said. You should call him yourself and talk to him. And she dictated a phone number over the line. This individual was a criminal figure in the city. He had visited the clinic when he suspected his wife of infidelity and believed that his son might not be his own. The man's suspicions turned out to be groundless, and he left the clinic reassured, but his phone number remained unrecurred. Alexis had heard whispers from the nurses about this man's activities but hadn't paid much attention to them, considering them mere gossip. Now, she remembered, found his number in the files, and gave it to Elizabeth. Let her talk to him herself. This criminal figure was named Stephen. He was indeed a complicated individual. When an unknown woman called him and arranged a meeting, he initially thought it was another lady looking to settle scores with her husband or lover. However, when Elizabeth explained what needed to be done, Stephen initially refused. Dealing with international transportation was quite troublesome. But when Elizabeth mentioned the fee, he reconsidered. All right, let's give it a try. He eventually agreed. That morning, Anna woke up very early, feeling a sense of unease. She stretched and sighed deeply. Apparently, she had a bad dream but she couldn't remember it. Enough of winding yourself up, Anna. It's time to get up, she told herself. Anna quickly had breakfast and checked on Philip. Her son was still asleep. She smiled and then sighed. Once again, her son would be without her for the whole day. The daycare was under renovation. Fortunately, her neighbor was always there to help. Just as she thought about her neighbor, she heard the gate creaking. So, are you getting ready? The elderly neighbor asked. Go on, Philip and I can handle it ourselves. I'm going to make pancakes for him. He'll wake up and have breakfast. Then we'll go to my garden. The raspberries are ripe, so we'll pick them. And then we'll find something else to do. Don't worry, your son will be well taken care of. And I'm not worried at all. You're my main helper. What would I do without you? Anna smiled gratefully. She got into her car and headed towards the village, towards the forest, where the sound of agricultural machinery was already audible. On the way, Anna pondered, should I have sent Philip to the city? Both Michael's parents and her own had offered to look after Philip for the month while the daycare was under renovation. But Anna couldn't even imagine being without her son for even a day, and she knew he would miss her. Yes, she had her hopes pinned on the neighbor grandmother. After checking on the work, Anna and Joseph hurried back to the county center. They were unexpectedly summoned to the agricultural department to sign some documents. They returned from the county center closer to noon. Anna drove Joseph home and then headed to her own house. On the way, she noticed a dark SUV. She thought, a stranger's car. I wonder who it came to see. She pulled into her yard. Seeing the gate open, Anna furrowed her brow. This was not good. What if Philip ran off somewhere? Or what if the neighbor's chickens wandered in and dug up all her flower beds? Then she heard a faint cry and sobbing coming from inside the house. Anna sprinted towards the source of the sounds. What happened? She shouted, rushed to her neighbor, and helped her to her feet. Oh, Anna, a disaster has occurred. I didn't watch Philip closely enough. And, wiping away her tears, the old lady told the story of how she and Philip had come back from the garden with freshly picked raspberries. The elderly lady was busy in the kitchen, mixing the berries with milk and sugar for dessert, and boiling a kettle for tea. Philip was playing in the hallway with the cat, 
Suddenly, a dark car stopped near the house. The neighbor had never seen it before. Two strong men entered the house. One of them grabbed Philip and they headed for the door. The neighbor rushed towards them. Then one of the strangers pushed the old lady. She fell, hit her head, and momentarily lost consciousness. When she came to, both the bandits and the child were gone. Anna, forgive me, I didn't protect our Philip. The old lady cried. Don't blame yourself for anything, Anna said with a trembling voice. What could you have done against two criminals? Oh Lord, why did they take Philip? Anna called an ambulance and the police, then jumped into her car and chased after the bandits. Now she was certain of the car she had seen along the way. There was only one road, and Anna was convinced she could catch up with them. She sped along the dusty road, but it was in vain. She pulled over, buried her head in the steering wheel, and burst into tears. She couldn't bear to think about where her little one was and what he was going through. Then Anna froze. She realized who might have taken her child. It was Elizabeth. There was no one else. And as soon as she thought of it, a police car appeared on the road. The rapid response team had arrived in response to her call. Anna jumped out of the car and, incoherently, began to explain to the investigator who she was and what had happened. She expressed her suspicions. Well, let's not waste any time, the investigator agreed, and called his colleagues in the regional center to find out more about this Elizabeth and, if possible, apprehend her. Law enforcement officers promptly got to work, but the only person they found was Elizabeth. She was calmly lounging in her hotel room, and when the police arrived, she was completely bewildered, took the child, she widened in her eyes. Oh, come on, how could I have organized all of this? The investigator had no leads. Nobody remembered the license plate of the car that came to the village, only the color and make. There were no surveillance cameras along the road, of course. The investigator considered another possibility. Maybe the child was kidnapped for ransom, but no one had called Anna yet, and she was sure that Elizabeth was behind it. Under Joseph's guidance, the men searched the surrounding forests, lakes, and abandoned houses but couldn't find anything. Meanwhile, Stephen had brought little Philip to the city. Stephen was pleased that he had managed to avoid all the police checkpoints. He took the less traveled roads where there were fewer cameras. He wasn't particularly worried about it. The car had fake plates, and the driver wore a cap pulled low over his forehead. He had Philip with him in the backseat. Nobody would find them. Stephen left Philip at an old cottage. In the evening, he planned to use another car to take the child to a border area. There, he had friends who would help transport the boy. One thing bothered him a little, though. The child was scared, crying all the time, and calling for his mother. Stephen wasn't entirely heartless, and he regretted getting involved in this adventure. But a substantial sum of money was at stake, and it was too late to back out now. Why are you crying? He tried to comfort Philip. We'll be with your mom very soon. Really? The child asked wiping away his tears and looking trustingly into the eyes of this big uncle. Of course, your mom asked me to bring you. Stephen reassured him. With some effort, Stephen calmed the child down and made a vow to himself. Never to get involved in such matters again, and maybe everything would have worked out for him. But then an anonymous call came into the police. A woman called and said she knew who had taken the child. She mentioned the name Stephen. From there, it was only a matter of time. Law enforcement determined Stephen's whereabouts. Soon, both he and the driver were apprehended as they were leaving town. Philip was in the backseat. When Anna received the news that the boy had been found, she nearly lost consciousness from relief. Then she burst into tears, but this time it was tears of joy because her little one had been found. Over a year passed. All those involved in the incident were punished. Stephen and his accomplice received substantial sentences. Elizabeth was also convicted for her role in the crime. Furthermore, her Italian husband divorced her. Alexis, who had made the anonymous call to the police, escaped with only a slight scare. The court recognized her cooperation with the investigation, and she went as a witness. However, she was dismissed from the laboratory, as the management didn't want someone with a questionable past working in their institution. During the trial, many facts came to light including the revelation that Philip was not Michael's biological son. Michael's parents were initially shocked, but over time, they accepted Philip as their own. 
Anna's parents were also surprised, but how could they turn away from a child who had become an integral part of their family? Anna and her son continued to live in the village. The terrifying events slowly faded from memory, and then, in Anna's life, another unexpected encounter occurred with someone she already knew, but who would have thought fate would bring them together. That year, spring was in no hurry. Even at the end of April, there was still snowfall and frost at night. Anna was concerned. But then, within a couple of days, the weather cleared up. The sun warmed the soil, saturated with thawed water, and the work began. Anna cheered up, and Joseph was inspired. He had plans to cultivate the field between the plots. There, the winds were not as harsh, and the moisture would be preserved. Anna agreed with the estate manager's decision. He was right. The land had been legally registered in her name for a long time, with no problems. This year, the fields would be plowed, and then the seeds sown. The wheat crop promised to be excellent. Joseph even joked that Anna had become a true agronomist over the years. Well, with so many years in the business, she had learned to understand it. And then, one morning, the tractors came to this piece of land. The mechanics knew their job, and they worked diligently. There was a small hill by the ditch. It had always been there for as long as the locals could remember, but no one had ever attached any importance to it. Just a hill, and the wind had blown it up over many centuries. And so, one of the tractor drivers decided to level that hill as well. Why should it just stand there unused? He had plowed through it, churning the soil. Then another driver saw something glinting in the freshly plowed earth. He got out to take a look, thinking maybe it was some parts fallen off the tractor. As he approached, he realized it was pottery shards and some metal objects. The other tractor driver came closer, scratching his head. It looks like we've stumbled upon some graves, he guessed. Oh, come on, that can't be true, he replied. I don't know, but people used to live here, right? And you see, this area had never been plowed before. Do you think they knew something about it? And then it was all forgotten. So, should we keep plowing quietly? But Anna will have problems later, won't she? They won't overlook something like this. Yo, you're right. Anna has had enough trials, the other driver agreed. The one who had uncovered the hill. Yes, the workers appreciated their young mistress and respected her knowing the difficult fate she had endured. They called Anna and told her everything. She arrived with Joseph shortly after. What is this? Anna asked in surprise, examining the pieces of clay pots. It was clear they were ancient. They decided to call in archaeologists. Let them decide how to proceed. After all, if this became known later, they couldn't avoid penalties. A few days later, specialists arrived. They set up camp near the forest and began to study and dig the very mound. Anna had plenty of her own work, but she was still curious about what the archaeologists had found. One afternoon, she drove up to the excavation site. Four men were taking a break, drinking tea in a clearing. Hello, Anna. One of them greeted her first. Come join us for some tea. Anna was surprised how this archaeologist knew her. They hadn't met before, as far as she could remember but she studied him more closely. He had a robust build, was stocky, and had a slight beard. Maybe they had seen each other somewhere. Don't recognize me? The man smiled. I'm Christopher. Remember, I came to see you. Anna suddenly remembered. It was Christopher, the one who had been searching for his family's treasure. At the time, she had been so afraid that he would demand compensation for the jewelry. But no, they had parted ways amicably. Christopher, so, you're an archaeologist now. I always was one. I also teach at the institute. And then, we were informed about these burial sites. I decided to come with my colleagues to investigate. Maybe later, I'll bring some students here for practice. You don't mind, do you? How could I possibly mind? Anna smiled. Who will even ask me for permission here? Yes, it must be disappointing that you had to interrupt your work. Abit, yes but it's okay. We'll get through it. You should join us for tea. So, conversing this way, Anna joined the company of archaeologists. Christopher and his colleagues turned out to be sociable guys, and they chatted. Anna left the field in good spirits. Well, never mind that field. Let the historians work on it. Soon, it became clear that the discovery was of real value. 
They found artifacts from the daily life of the Finno-Ugric people. Christopher started to see Anna more and more frequently. Sometimes he would visit her, and they would chat in the gazebo. Philip was often around. You have a wonderful son. Christopher once remarked, and for some reason, he sighed sadly. Do you have children? Anna asked cautiously. No, my wife didn't want any. She kept saying she needed time for herself, and now it's too late. What do you mean, too late? We got divorced. Christopher shared that he had been married for nearly 10 years. His wife had worked with him at the same institute, and everything had seemed fine. But then his wife confessed that she had rekindled her first love. They had been divorced for six months now. It's sad, but I'm sure you'll find love again, Anna said. You're a very good and decent person. I'm still grateful to you. You didn't make a fuss about the jewelry back then, although you could have. I didn't act completely honestly at the time. I should have turned in the valuables instead of selling them to third parties. You were saving a child, Christopher firmly replied. I had no moral right to ask anything from you. Yes, but I must confess now that I used part of the money to develop my farm. I probably should compensate you for that amount. We'll have the harvest season in the fall, and then I'll be able to pay you back. There's no need to return anything. You invested that money in the land's development, creating additional job opportunities and a rural life. I see how hard you're working. People in the area speak highly of you. What do they say? They say you're an excellent manager and a decent person. But, but what? Happiness won't smile upon you. An elderly lady in the store once said, My happiness is my son, Anna said confidently. Christopher smiled in response and winked at Philip, who was clearly yawning while sitting next to his mom. Anna noticed this and wanted to pick up her son, but Christopher offered to help. He carried Philip inside, and Anna put her son to bed. Afterward, they stood in the yard, gazing at the stars. Anna, may I ask you another question? Christopher broke the nighttime silence. Anna shrugged and nodded in response. Did you love your husband very much? Anna sighed, not saying anything, and just looked up at the sky. There had been a time when Michael stood beside her, and happiness was abundant, but then everything happened, her husband's betrayal, his infidelity, his guilt, and then Philip a child who was, in essence, a stranger, but had become the dearest to Anna. She looked at Christopher and said, I love Michael, but that's all in the past. They exchanged meaningful glances, but then, as if coming to their senses, both became a bit embarrassed and started to say their goodbyes. As autumn drew nearer, Christopher left for the city. The new academic year was about to begin, and he had to be at the institute. However, truth be told, he wasn't eager to return. I guess you like the field conditions, and asked. Yes, I'm accustomed to such conditions. We've cooperated on archaeological trips before. I really enjoy this lifestyle, but this time, there's another reason. What is it? I don't want to leave you. Christopher looked into her eyes. Anna felt flustered and didn't know what to say. She, too, was saddened by Christopher's departure. She had grown used to their meetings, conversations, and walks. But expressing this was beyond her. I'm sorry for making you feel uneasy. Christopher said quietly. You were busy with your own plans, and then here I am. No, it's all right. I was just planning. What? Many years ago, Michael wanted to plant a garden in this place but never got around to it. Now, I'm inspired by that idea. Do you think I can make it happen? You can achieve anything? Christopher smiled. Suddenly, he took her hand, kissed it, and then quickly said, goodbye, as he hurried back to his car. Goodbye. Anna whispered a reply. And then winter returned, long and cold, late in the evenings. After putting her son to bed, Anna would sit in her armchair, covered in a blanket, and reminisce about the events of past years. Yes. So much had happened in her life. Yet, for some reason, it all felt like a dream. What lay ahead in her life, work, home, and the responsibilities of being a mother, all of that was fine and right. But deep in her heart, she longed for something more. Anna understood that she had been pushing these thoughts away, but she simply craved love, not some illusory love, but the real thing. And there was one person she thought about constantly, Christopher. However, he hadn't called her since he left, and she didn't reach out either, driven by pride. Sometimes, she yearned to dial his number, but she scolded herself. 
What would she even say to him? How are you doing? And that's it. She recalled their parting and her heartache. Then, one day, just before Christmas, there was a knock on the door. Anna and Philip were in the middle of decorating the Christmas tree. She initially thought it was their neighbor, who often visited their home. The door opened, and a man in a thick winter coat and a cap stood on the threshold. At first, she didn't recognize him, but then it hit her. Oh, Christopher, she stammered. Uncle Christopher. Philip joyfully shouted and rushed to hug the guest. Philip, I just came from outside. Christopher laughed with delight, though he also looked hesitantly at Anna. She stared at him, bewildered, not knowing what to say. Right now, Uncle Christopher will take off his coat and you can hug him to your heart's content. She finally managed to say, Christopher didn't need to be asked twice. He took off his coat, hugged Philip tightly, and then handed him a package. Here, I met Santa Claus on the street, and he asked me to give you this. He winked at the boy. Oh, Uncle Christopher, I'm not a little kid anymore, but you bought this for me. Philip laughed and pulled out a large red remote control car from the package. Wow, it's so cool. The boy went off to play in his room, and Anna led her guest to the kitchen, where she poured some tea. She had managed to regain her composure and appeared quite composed. An unexpected surprise, she remarked. It was a surprise. I hope you liked it, Christopher said, pausing before adding, forgive me. For what? Anna inquired. For not calling you. I couldn't. And Christopher began to tell what had happened to him. Upon his arrival in the city in mid-September, Christopher had an exam retake for third-year students. Among the students was a certain Margaret. She was rather foolish but came from wealthy parents. Predictably, she failed the exam. Afterward, Margaret came to Christopher's office, pleading for at least a passing grade. Christopher, be a dear and give me a passing grade, Margaret insisted. Margaret, you're wasting my time and yours, Christopher told her, as he focused on filling out his records. Christopher, can I show my gratitude in some way? He looked at her in surprise and simply shook his head. Everyone knew Christopher was an incorruptible lecturer, but Margaret had no intention of giving up. While Christopher was busy with his records, she stood by his side. He didn't even glance at her. Then, he looked up and was taken aback. Margaret unbuttoned her blouse and stared at him intently. Don't you want to? She whispered softly. Margaret, fix your clothes, was all he said. You'll regret this, she whispered. Then, the unimaginable happened. Margaret suddenly screamed loudly, leaped off the lectern, and ran through the institute in tears. She portrayed everything as if Christopher had harassed her and she had resisted. Later, Margaret reported to the dean that Christopher had repeatedly made advances towards her, and that's why he failed her in the exams. Thanks to her influential father's intervention, everyone believed Margaret, and Christopher was in utter disbelief. He tried in vain to prove that it was all nonsense. He was suspended from work and faced criminal charges. Nobody knew how it would end, but it was his ex-wife who came to his rescue. Even though she had left him for someone else, she was still an honorable person, and her current husband happened to be a lawyer. He untangled the mess, insisted on a polygraph test, and only then was it revealed that Margaret was lying. She was expelled from the university, and not even her father could help. The Institute's administration apologized to Christopher and invited him back to work. But after everything he had been through, Christopher couldn't imagine working with students or interacting with colleagues who had been ready to condemn him just yesterday. Christopher resigned. He didn't know what to do next. Throughout this ordeal, he had been thinking about Anna, wanting to call her, hear her voice, but he hadn't mustered the courage. However, just before Christmas, he suddenly realized that he couldn't go on like this. If you love someone, you have to tell them. And there he was with Anna, gazing into each other's eyes. Anna, I love you, he softly said. I just want you to know that. But now I'm not a university professor anymore, just an ordinary unemployed man. Perhaps you don't need someone like me. I do, Anna whispered in response. They welcomed the new year together as a trio, marking the beginning of a new life. In the spring, Christopher actively immersed himself in work. The former historian proved to be a capable worker, particularly skilled in horticulture. Over the winter, he had studied all of Anna's late husband's notes and books, and he began laying out the orchard. 
Apple trees, cherry trees, raspberry bushes, and currant bushes were among his initial plantings. Christopher would disappear into the orchard for entire days, sometimes even spending the night on the property. He practically chased Anna out of the garden whenever she tried to help. You have enough on your plate. Go to the office, Christopher would tell her. Of course, he wasn't working alone. He had five hired helpers, and it was tough, labor-intensive work with results that wouldn't be seen immediately. Five years passed. In the place of the former field now stood young apple trees, laid in cherry branches, rows of ripe raspberries and currants, all adorned with plump berries. Christopher also planted plum and pear trees in his orchard, along with apricot trees and sprawling grapevines. People from not only the neighborhood but also the region would visit for fruit and berries, treating it as a little excursion. Several times, important officials even came to visit. In short, the reputation of the fruit garden extended far beyond the confines of the small village. Christopher was often exhausted, but the garden had become his brainchild and the purpose of his life. Well, not entirely. His true purpose in life was his family. Christopher and Anna had married immediately after their first New Year together. Initially, Anna was deeply involved in the work, but gradually, she stepped aside. She realized that she wanted to be just a woman and not a workhorse. Anna spent more time at home, taking care of their son and creating a cozy atmosphere. Joseph, their son, now managed the fields and the farm. He had acquired all the necessary skills from his father and managed his responsibilities quite competently. Sometimes, as Anna looked at the waving fields, the grazing cattle, and the growing garden, she thought, could Michael have ever imagined that his legacy would flourish like this? He would probably have been so happy. She remembered her first husband, of course, but with a gentle sadness. Her heart now belonged only to Christopher. And then, two years after her second marriage, Anna suddenly started feeling unwell, experiencing dizziness and nausea. She had some doubts but it seemed unbelievable. She went to see a doctor, and the physician at the local clinic had some delightful news for her she was pregnant. But how can this be? I was told before that it was impossible, she asked the doctor. There's always a chance, the doctor smiled. And your case is living proof of that. When Christopher learned of his wife's pregnancy, he became the happiest man in the world. Soon there would be four of them. Well, he was slightly off. At the fourth month ultrasound, Anna was revealed to be expecting twins, much to their delight. Anna gave birth to a boy and a girl. Philip was especially delighted because now he had both a little brother and a little sister, and he was the eldest, their protector. The only thing that worried the growing boy was whether they would love him as before. One day, he asked his mom about it. My little one, Anna smiled, our love won't go anywhere. You'll forever be our eldest and beloved boy, and a real family, of course. Why do you ask? Philip fell silent, then admitted that his grandmother, Amanda, and his mom had recently told him he was an orphan. Philip knew that Christopher wasn't his biological father, but his mother was, so he was confused. But his grandmother just sighed. Then he overheard her conversation with his grandfather. His grandmother mentioned that it was a common superstition that when you bring an orphan into the house, you subsequently have your own children. That's what happened with Anna. She adopted Philip, and that's how they got the other children. Philip didn't understand everything, but the idea that his mom had adopted him stuck in his mind. At first, he didn't say anything to his mom. He silently shed tears. But then he asked if his mom needed him. Anna had to confess the truth to her son. She assured him a thousand times that she had always loved him and would continue to do so. Christopher joined the conversation, emphasizing that Philip was their true family. Their love and care alleviated the child's anxieties. And so, these five years passed since Christopher and Anna got married. Philip was now 12, Sydney and Mark were three. The kids got along splendidly. Philip was mom's right-hand man. He helped with the little ones, read them books, and played with them. Sydney and Mark adored Philip, and he adored them. Sometimes Anna would contemplate her husband and children and wonder if she had ever imagined that her life would turn out this way. Certainly not. There had been a devastating loss in her life that could have broken her, followed by the revelation that came after that loss. Yes, her husband's betrayal could have shattered her too, 
but she endured because her maternal strength had manifested itself to the fullest. She wanted to be a mother, and she became one. Philip's illness had shown her that there were wonderful people around her who could come to her aid, and sometimes, even your own family members could work miracles. A miracle. Yes, a miracle had happened in her life when a dead-end situation had turned into the beginning of a new path, a new chapter in her life. She had met Christopher. At first, she couldn't have imagined that their meeting would lead to something greater. Yes, there had been bad people on her path, but life had punished them on its own. And what lay ahead? Ahead was a tranquil, steady life and happiness.